everywhere, no twilight shadows deepen. Praise the Lord. Well, um, it's always a joy, as I said, to be here and uh, to be with just just family. And my wife uh, sent her love again last night. Said, "Make sure and tell them I'm sorry that I missed it." And and uh, I I joke and cut a lot of people just like, "How in the world does your wife put up with you?" And and uh, well, the same way some of y'all's wife puts up with you. And and. Uh, <laughs> I remember several years ago, um, 
I was in a church in uh, um, Alabama, and uh, unbeknownst to me, they had, it was the Assembly of God Church, and so they have a lot of pastoral changes. And uh, the pastor had left between the time that I was there first time and the second time. And unbeknownst to me, the church was in a big uproar and a fight. And uh, I developed a message to preach what the Lord had directed. And uh, my message that morning was on joy. And they had three sections. And that side was mad at that side. And that side was mad at that side. And these two sides was mad at the folk in the middle. And... Uh, and I didn't know that. So I got up and took my text on joy. And I started preaching about the joy of the Lord. And uh, there was a gentleman probably in his late 70s sitting on the second seat and the platform was about right here. Had him to stand for the word. He wouldn't stand up. He's mad. Didn't like me last time I was there. Didn't know that. But then I learned and then I didn't like him. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't say I didn't love him. I said I didn't like him. You can love folk and not like them. Sure you can. Go to a family reunion. <clears throat> you figure that out, don't you? So he got mad, throws his knees up in the seat and folded his arms like that, you know, grown man acting like he's six. Well, I don't know why I say that. My kids didn't act that way. I'd beat them. And uh, your kids, I got great kids. Sorry how yours turned out. But I have great kids. And uh, so about 20 minutes into that sermon, I realized that he wasn't enjoying it at all. <clears throat> His wife was sitting beside him. and <clears throat> I just squared off and looked him right in the face while I was preaching and said, it is beyond my comprehension how some people can call themselves a child of God. They're mean, they're hateful. Probably their wife has been miserable living with them for 50 years. And if I kept coming to church and didn't want to be there that bad, if I was that person, I'd just get up and leave. <laughs> and then I would commence to preach on the other side of the platform. The preacher, that's just uncalled for. He started it. <laughs> yeah. So I came back to the other side of the platform <laughs> and he decided to take my advice. <laughs> Grabbed his Bible. That's been several years ago. Grabbed his Bible, started out the door and... Uh, got to the back door. Now, don't, don't, no, don't freak out. Listen to me. Grown man got to the back door and turned around and waved at me, not using all of his fingers. Oh. oh. And he said, oh, that's horrible. I actually got tickled. Why? Because I realized at that moment the mileage I'm going to get out of this for years to come. And uh, so we went on about our business and I got tickled again. And let me get my briefcase. I've got some in there I've put in there and I want to get. And I got tickled again and I laughed and, and then I got tickled a third time and the fourth time and I said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what I'm laughing at. And I finished my sermon, went to eat and the interim pastor there said, um, what was so funny? And I told him. He said, oh, but Cole, I am so sorry. I said, oh, I don't worry about it. I said, uh, he's, he's got what he's got coming to him. And uh, he said, uh, he said, well, I'm going to go visit him this afternoon. Is there anything you want me to tell him? I said, yeah, I'll tell him. I'm here through Tuesday night. If he comes back, I'm going to whip him. <laughs> and he, he laughed like you laughed. And he said, what do you really want me to tell him? I said, tell him if he comes back, I'm going to whip him. He said, are you serious? I said, I'm serious as I can be. Would you do that, preacher? God called me to fight the devil and he gave no specifics how to go about it. And what some folk need is just a good whipping. Now, don't get in a fight in the parking lot today after church. I'm going to say Brother Caldwell sanctioned it. So we preached Sunday night, Monday night and Tuesday night, and the power of God fell in that building. People hugging next, apologized. They had 180-something folk on Sunday morning. By Tuesday night, we had over 350. And folk were hugging and apologizing, loving one another. And after church, um, Man come to me and said, Brother Colin, I ain't talking to you. He said, I'm a deacon here at this church. And he said, I'm 56 years old. And he said, uh, what happened Sunday morning? I want to apologize. I, said, I don't worry about it. I said, God moved out around. He said, no, he said, I need to talk to you. He said, that was my dad. And he said, I went and seen my dad this afternoon. And I talked to him. And I said, Brother, look, I'm leaving tomorrow. 
don't have family problems over me. And he said, no. Brother Collins said, I didn't go see him as his son. I went to see him as a deacon in this church. And I told him, I've been in this church 56 years. And this week we had the greatest move of God that I've ever seen in my life. And my dad got upset and said, well, maybe I don't need to go back. And he said, well, as a deacon in this church, that's what I'm here to tell you. Unless you straighten up, we don't need you back. The preacher, that's just awful. You know what? Before the children of Israel went over into the promised land, there's some old bird that had to die. He was the last one. Do you have to die for God to get done what he wants to get done? Are you the last? Are y'all with me right now? Are you the last holdout? Do you have to get out of the way for God to accomplish? I don't want that. I want to be a part of what God, you know, I, I don't care if I'm, I, look here, I don't care if I'm hauling water. I just want to be a part of it, amen? Find your place. I've had a lot of young preachers come to me and say, oh, Brother Caldwell, I won't be just like you. I don't want you to be like me. If you were like me, one of us just became unnecessary. God called you to be who you are. And, and, and you need to be who you are because God made you special. That ain't just a cliche. He made you. You get all kinds of issues. I know I can tell by looking at you. And you can't tell my issues because I hide them. But everybody got issues. From the pulpit to the front door to the side to side to the base, everybody got issues. What you got to do is move beyond self-condemnation. Because if you can get in the presence of God, see, what the devil does is he tries to condemn you with self-condemnation to keep you away from church. If you got issues, dude, church is where you need to be. Well, people know what I've done. Well, so what? So what? You, well, I wish you could see their history. They wasn't all that in a bag of chips. Some of them, 95 years old, was mean as a rattlesnake back in the early part of the last century. Amen. Amen? I wasn't talking to you, Winston McClure. But I, <laughs> you, you amened in the wrong spot. Amen. <laughs> But I've heard some stories, so I'm not going to get, I'm not going to talk. I've talked to Sister Jerry. I'm not going to get into that. Look, at everybody's got issues. Everybody's got issues. And I can't tell you everything that God has done for me. Why can't you, Brother Cole? I can tell you some, but I can't tell you everything. So if I tell you everything, some church folk would just be upset at me. Some of them wouldn't even want to hear me preach anymore. So see, sometimes you just have to praise God for what he's done just for you and you have to do what I call secret code. Sometimes you can't say anything because, you know, it freaks church people out. If you tell what God brought you and your wife out of or, or what you and your ex-wife went through, you can't tell folks. Sometimes you just got to just, you know, sometimes you just got to just get up and walk. Mm, thank you, Jesus. I can't tell you what I'm walking about because then you'd be upset at me if I told you. So I'm just going to walk because he knows what I'm walking about. So next time you do this or that, and does, that some, does it take all that? Shut up. Yeah, it does. You don't know what this is. You don't know what that, but I know. So I'm just going to go ahead and praise him. Amen. <laughs> Get past yourself. Amen. Thank you for Friday and Saturday night and, and we've had a huge response from the internet. Thank you for airing that. We've had a huge response from uh, um, on our website and, and messages that people have sent. And so thank you for airing that on the internet. Uh, those teachings will be available um, coming up soon, hopefully by the end of this week. And uh, you keep us in our prayers. Um, uh, my wife and youngest son and his wife, uh, my youngest son and his wife came down uh, last Sunday uh, to visit with us. They picked a week to get away and didn't know I was going to have to leave. And uh, that's fine. Um, him and his wife and my wife are leaving today to drive my car from Houston up to Oklahoma, just south of Tulsa. And then tonight we're going over to Prestonsburg and then we're going to be at Stafford, uh, Staffordville, Kentucky on Monday and Tuesday night. And some of y'all coming over tomorrow night. And then uh, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then Thursday night, we're going to fly to Tulsa. And uh, then next Sunday, I'm going to be in Stigler, Oklahoma. Next Sunday night, I'm going to be in Red Oak, Oklahoma. And then a week from tomorrow, we're going to go to Dallas. 
And by next Tuesday, I'm going to try my best to get to the house for 72 hours because then I've got to preach in Indianapolis. And so you keep us in your prayers, if you would, because um, I'm going to be sharing some stuff with you this morning that, that God needs to give me strength. Amen? God needs to give me strength. And uh, now I'm going to share a little bit of testimony with you while we're preaching. Uh, before that, let me tell you real quick what we've got. Um, product back there. We have our God's Time Clock series is our six hour, six plus hours of our teaching precursor to what I've taught the last two uh, services. And then um, this is a, a CD that we did, the, the DVD, the, the, the film, actually the master messed up and we don't have it on DVD. It's a message called Hidden Seed. I preached about three or four years ago. I've talked some here about seed, but not this message in its entirety. And uh, it's the hidden seed, and I follow the seed line all the way from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And I talked the other night about seed, don't do anything but grow. But I preached this message at Pastor Hagee's church uh, a couple years ago at San Antonio. And uh, if you don't know who Pastor Hagee is, he's got a little struggling ministry down in San Antonio. And uh, they're great people, they're great, they're family. And uh, this message, I, I don't talk much about it, but it is, it is one of the best messages. Matter of fact, Pastor Hagee says it's the best message he ever heard on, on sowing and reaping. And uh, so uh, this message here is called He's the Best I've Ever Seen. Uh, if you, <laughs> that's hard to forget, ain't it, man? Y'all were there, wasn't you? Yeah. I preached this at one of Perry Stone's conferences. And uh, it's just, once you preach it at a church, you can't ever preach it there again. 20 years later, you can't preach it because nobody forgets it. And uh, it's astounding. It's a message where I put Jesus Christ on trial to see if he's worthy to reclaim the church. We know that he's, the, he's worthy to be the Lamb of God. He's already been that. He is that. And uh, <clears throat> the Lamb, now the Lion. But is he worthy to reclaim the church? And I put him on trial. God's the judge. Philosophy's a court reporter. Michael's a sergeant of arms. Holy Ghost is a bailiff. Truth, love, sanctification, goodness, regeneration, holiness is in the jury. And the prosecuting attorney is justice. The defendant's attorney is mercy. And um, the defendant is Jesus himself. And I call five witnesses to the stand. Natural law, time, death, the grave, and eternity. And they all are examined and cross-examined to find out. And they all come to one conclusion. This Jesus fella well, he's just about the best that I have ever seen. Amen. It's a great, great, powerful message. I actually wrote that message in, in, in the mid-90s, I guess, in a Sunday school room in a church in about three and a half hours. And I've heard it preached all over. I've heard other preachers preach this. Well, they've tried. They can't come close. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> I've heard them preach it. And as a matter of fact, there's a person preached over in Arizona. Somebody went up to him, said, you know what I said? I heard Randy Caldwell preach that. This back in the 90s. And they said, you know what I said? I heard he's preaching that. <laughs> Nod head. <laughs> Uh, what else we got, Kayla? Uh, yeah, our book. Uh, this book is worth buying just for the picture on the front. <coughs> what else we got? It really is a good book. It really is good stuff. And uh, <clears throat> is this for me? Oh, that's today. Oh, this is today's bulletin. Awesome. Great. Prayer increases faith. Prayer provokes a place to unload burdens. Provides, rather. I need my glasses. Prayer teaches you that God is always near. Prayer trains you not to panic. Prayer draws you in deeper and strengthens your relationship with God. This morning, I'm preaching on prayer. So that's why my daughter pointed that out. <clears throat> These forms right here, the Shemitah year <clears throat> is a year that they don't plant anything in Israel Every seventh year, they let the uh, land rest. And uh, then you have the Shemitah year uh, that started last fall that ends this September. And I don't say the first, but one of the first. I've been told we're going to be the first one officially to do planting in Israel this September. It ends on the 14th of September, and uh, which is uh, Rosh Hashanah, isn't it? the 14th of September of this year in just a couple of months. And we're going to be planting olive trees in the land of Israel. Now, uh, we have a special uh, place, a grove, that they've allowed us to purchase to lease for 99 years. Uh, it's on a military base in Israel. And um, I just started to tell you exactly where, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that. 
for some reason. I just felt checked. Maybe it's because somebody's watching the internet. I don't know. Uh, but uh, if you want to know later, just uh, come up and I'll tell you. If you would like to plant a tree uh, in, the, in the name of your family, a children, a lost loved one, um, someone that's passed away, uh, there's a tree there for my parents. There's a tree there for my wife's parents. Several minister friends of mine. In 2010, uh, I lost seven minister friends of mine from January to June. And uh, that, was, that was mentors in my life that just was gone. And uh, so I planted trees for all those guys. There's one for all my children. And we're planting in this grove 1,500 trees. And uh, was y'all there when they unveiled the big rock? Was y'all there? When the unveiler, y'all just saw the rock. Saw you saw it, okay. Uh, <clears throat> what they done, and it's just God's given us great favor in the land of Israel, is they had uh, a sculpture, a very well-known sculpture there in town, uh, there in Jerusalem, in the nation of Israel, that went to the military base, took a rock, a huge stone there on the base, uh, chiseled it out, smoothed it over, done carvings, engraved it, put our name, our ministry's logo, uh, on this big stone. A lot of people put up steins, but it's hard to move a boulder. They can tear signs down, but it's hard to move a boulder. And, uh, and I'm not talking about a rock. I'm talking about it's a rock. And uh, you, 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 you're going to need a backhoe to move it, and uh, to roll it at least. And uh, so anyway, we go there and we plant these trees. We've got 1,500 trees. I think we're up to 600, maybe 700 uh, before we finish this certain area to go to another. But... Uh, when, the, when Rosh Hashanah comes around, we're going to be one of the first uh, ministries to plant uh, back after Shemitah year. It's vitally important. And me and my family are uh, <clears throat> putting about 25 trees in the ground ourselves there. Because the Bible makes it very clear, uh, Hosea does, that at the end times before the Messiah shows up, you'll know the Messiah is going to show up when the righteous Gentiles begin to cause the land of Israel to bloom and to grow and begin to plant olive groves and vineyards. That's what the Bible says. And we're not the only ministry. There's many ministries that do that. And, uh, but we're very excited about it. So if you would like, uh, with these comes the king's oil and, and a prayer tallit and um, a prayer shawl rather than a tallit. And so those are available to you. If you'd like to partner with our ministry, we have some of that back there. It's available to you. Pick your Bibles up if you would and go to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter number five. And uh, brought my briefcase over here to get my glasses and didn't get my glasses. Now you think it's funny, you ought to have to live like this. 3 old ladies sitting around talking one day. One of them said, boy, my memory's got so bad, I can't even hardly remember my own name. And the other one said, it's got so bad, I can't remember anything. I tie a string around my finger to remember what I was supposed to remember and then forget what I tied the string around. Third old lady sitting there and she said, I'll tell you, I'm up in years, but my memory is as good as it has always been. Come in. <laughs> so, <laughs> see, some of y'all are in that situation. All right. <clears throat> Stand to your feet, if you will, for the reading of the word of God. Let's start in Revelation chapter number five. Revelation chapter number five and verse number eight. Bible says, and when he had taken the book and the four beasts and four and 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Go over to the book of Revelation chapter number eight and let's look at verse number three. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of that incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now I want you to go to the New Testament <clears throat> just for a moment. And uh, I want you to go over to um, 
2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. And I want to look at verse, beginning verse number 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. And all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. This is why I was so stirred up when they were singing a while ago about you've prayed all night. You've awakened the master. Because he said, I've heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I, God, shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Not caused by the devil, but God said, if I do it, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You should underline that word wicked because it's actually the Hebrew word ra, R-A, ra. Um, it actually means useless. So he says, if my people at the church, it's called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their useless ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Prayer still changes things. Prayer and praise have a smell to it. God can smell your praise. God knows the intent of the heart and God can smell your prayers. So we're going to talk about this morning. The smell of a prayer still changes things. Father, I thank you, Lord, today for your anointing. I thank you for just, Lord, just just the, the last 36, 48 hours, not even 48 hours. You have so blessed us in this building. Lord, I'm asking you now to help me have direction, clarity as I begin to minister to these people what you would have them to hear. Help me now to be lifted up above my abilities in this house and we give you praise and honor and glory as you open their ears and give me direction and for them to receive. We give you praise and honor and glory. Everybody glad you're saved. Shout amen. Amen. Go ahead and sit down. I want to talk to you this morning about prayer. I want to talk to you that prayer still changes things. The smell of a prayer, it still changes things. It, it, it really does. We have stuck it on, on bumper stickers and posters and T-shirts and banners until we've let that phrase that prayer changes things actually lose its significance to us. But there is something about prayer. You, you don't have to pray and, and get goosebumps, but when you pray, the Bible makes it very clear in the book of Revelation that God bottles up prayers. And he says that if my people, which are called by my name, if you pray, he says, I will come and he, I will hear, and I will come and heal their land. Now, I talked to someone last night about their land process, uh, knowing what I was going to be preaching this morning. I was very careful with what I said, so let me get very clear uh, this morning about their land. I do believe that trouble is coming to America within the next 60 days. I believe that. You might as well get ready for it. I started back last year and told them in the summer of 2015, things are going to get rough. I believe we're headed for an economical collapse. Uh, you don't have to be spiritual to uh, uh, divine that. You don't, you don't have to be spiritual to pick up on that because anybody knows a child in fifth grade math can tell you that the numbers don't add up. You understand? And you can't just print money and just, and just hope that it gets covered. When we moved away, let me give you a little economic lesson. When we moved away, Way from the gold standard. Now, now you can say what you want to about, about different presidents, and, and I can talk about Richard Nixon, you can talk about what a crook he was, but you should listen to him. He told you, 
You know, he wasn't a crook. Amen. But understand, what I believe what happened to Richard Nixon is he just got caught. Amen. Uh, I believe everybody, Democrat, Republican, has done stuff from, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson and Kennedy. And, and in my lifetime, President, everybody has done something. Even, even the uh, great president that I feel that Ronald Reagan was, we had the Iran Contra. We, we had problems there of things that people were doing that they were hoping nobody would find out about. Now we've got... Uh, uh, stuff going on in Benghazi and when all that comes out, honey, it's going to hit the fan because there were some underhanded things that were done. So understand that <clears throat> Richard Nixon, he just got caught, but what he actually done was helped to bring about a prosperity, a paper prosperity to the nation of America. America began to prosper when it began to support the nation of Israel when Israel uh, claimed its statehood and its independence and became uh, a Jewish state. Now, now let, me, let me just, there's a rabbit jump, so let me hang on just a minute. It just cracks me up with the people that are hollering to support the Palestinians and, and, then their, and their goal is give us our independence. That's exactly what they're saying. Uh, give us, why don't Israel give the Palestinians their independence? Let me explain something to you about independence. Independence is not given, it is declared. You understand what I'm saying? If you give independence, it's not independence, it's not freedom, it's an allowance. If you want independence, uh, America claimed its independence from England. You have to understand that Jamaica has claimed its independence back in the 50s from Britain. So I understand that in order to have independence, it is not given, it is declared. So from the time that Israel declared its independence and Harry S. Truman told uh, the first prime minister, Ben Gurin, that, that they, we congratulated them three minutes after they declared it, uh, America began to prosper because the Bible says if you bless the Jewish people, Abraham's descendants, he's going to bless you. If you curse them, he's going to curse you. Well, what happened in the 70s is we began to move away from the actual standard of something to back up the dollar and we moved to what is called a petrodollar. Now what Richard Nixon done is he got it passed at the UN that there is literally, you could not buy oil anywhere in the world unless you bought it with American dollars. It's called the petrodollar, with American dollar. So in order for uh, uh, Saudi Arabia or, or uh, India or any country to purchase oil from anywhere, even their own, if they're gonna purchase it, they had to change their money into American dollars to buy oil with the American dollar. Now, part of the problem, oh, I didn't know I was going to get into all this stuff, so hang on. Part of the problem with the first Iraq war, now Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. I got that, okay? He was a bad guy, but part of, and I'm not saying all of the reason, but part of the reason that the first Iraq war took place was because Saddam Hussein had decided that he was no longer going to buy and sell oil with the American dollar. He was going to do it with the Iraqi money. And so if that would have happened, the economy of America would have took a big hit, if not collapse. And so they went in to remove Saddam Hussein. Now, I understand Saddam Hussein was a bad guy, and hopefully before that rope hit its end, he repented. If not, he went to hell. And, uh, you know, I watched the whole goings and I mean, I never could figure out for the life of me why they couldn't find Saddam Hussein, why it took so long. Dear God, Larry King interviewed him six months earlier. Uh, I, I don't know why they give Larry King a knife and tell him stab that idiot. Larry knows where he's at. And so understand that, that that's what began to happen when we begin to move away from the gold standard. And so understand that now we are printing money that there is nothing to back it up with because if the world and other countries like China and Russia move away, and I think they're going to this fall, from the purchase of oil with the American dollar, the economy is going to crumble. And you're gonna to need to know whom you have believed in and persuaded that he's able to keep that which you have committed unto him against that day. Now that we've had an economic lesson, let me talk to you about how that you need to know how to be safe. Because if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face, and pray, turn from their useless ways, pray, 
I will hear and come and heal their land. Now you have to know that, that when the children of Israel was in Egypt in the land of Goshen, when the plagues came, it was only upon the Egyptians. Although there was a curse that was brought about by God upon the land of Egypt, God's people that trusted in him was not affected by that. So I'm telling you to be smart and to be wise because God, if you pray, will heal your land. I believe that prayer is the key, but you need to know that God judges nations by the leadership, okay? It ain't got nothing to do with the people in the land. It's got to do with the decisions that is made by the leadership, and God judges the nation by the leadership. And at this point, Democrat or Republican, not going to get into that, we have had for several years a lack of true leadership in this nation. Now, I, I, I'm not I'm not promoting this or that or whatever, not trying to knock from the pulpit. And I'm, you know, I, I, I liked as a person uh, George Bush. I didn't agree with everything that George Bush done. Matter of fact, the last 18 months of his presidency, I believe George just got tired of getting his brains kicked out and set a rain on it and just let a lot of things go that he should have handled. But whether you like him or whether you don't like him, that old cowboy was in charge. <laughs> and, and he believed what he said, right or wrong, what his decision was, he believed what he said. You cannot have true leadership in the federal government, in the state government, in the county government, in the church, or in your home if there is no absolutes. My God, I'm into something this morning. If there is no absolutes, you have to understand that I have seen the marches on Washington, D.C., and people carrying signs for years, and they're screaming about prayer in school. We need prayer in school. I'm sick of seeing the marches. I'm sick of seeing the signs hollering prayer in school. Shut up about prayer in school. We ain't got prayer in the church for heaven's sakes. Well, you need to understand that when you get prayer, back in the home and back in the church. It will be in the county government. It will get in the state government. It will get in the federal government and prayer will be back in the schools. Do you understand that? You cannot build a house from the roof down. You have to build a house from the foundation up. And it is time that the people of God quit letting prayer be their last resort and let it be your first choice. That when somebody says something or a problem comes up, your first response needs to be Let's take this to the Lord in prayer. Guys, I'm trying to tell you that prayer moves the hand of God. That's why it bothers me when people look at me. I used to. I'm over 50 now and I couldn't care less. People used to talk about me in my younger days uh, preaching. They'd say, well, you know, I don't, I don't like his ministry. He, he seems like a smart aleck. Well, you know, it's set in. It's, you know, the stain set in, so that's just how I am deal with it, okay? And it used to bother me when people say, well, you know, I don't like his ministry. He don't move me. Really? really? I don't move you? Well, when did our services start revolving around you? That if you don't get moved, we ain't had church. We've not come in this house to move you. We've not come in here to move me. We've come in here to move the hand of God. And when you move God, and you move the hand of God by prayer, I promise you God will begin to move people. Well, preacher, you don't understand my position. This church couldn't get by without me. This church couldn't survive without my checkbook. I'll bet you it can. Well, I can't nobody preach like me. Can't nobody sing like me. Can't nobody teach like me. Let me tell you something, hot dog. You got to understand that in Lexington and Louisville right now, there's an old boy sleeping underneath a bridge. He's strung out on drugs and He's drunker than Cooter Brown. And he can out sing you and out preach you and out give you and out teach you. And if God has to, he'll go downtown, save the old boy, sober him up, bring him to Moorhead, and set him in your seat just to show you he don't have to have you to get by. He is looking for a willing vessel. So I'm here to declare to you this morning that if you are God's people, if you will call on him, I don't care if it ain't nothing but a whisper, a prayer before you get out of bed in the morning. God is watching and God is getting a hold of it and God is bawling at the prayers and I do declare to you this morning call on him while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near and if you pray God will change things. Somebody give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> so if he will come and heal your land Okay, that means that God will take care of situations. I'm not saying that America will be healed if you pray tomorrow morning, 
But when you pray, that starts the foundation and God will cover you and your family and what you cover by prayer. Stop here and let's shout. <clears throat> America with Supreme Court decisions that has happened in the last few weeks and the lack of leadership that we're seeing in this nation today is because the church is reaping what she's sown. You can't blame a political party. Look here. They ain't none of them known what they're doing the last 35, 40 years. None of them. They just make stuff up. Shocks me to see leaders, so-called leaders, on television that have said stuff for years and repeated it. And they're told if you go that direction, this is what's going to happen. And then what happens, what they were warned is going to happen. They're confronted about it. And then they say, I didn't say that. Yeah. Are you retarded? We have videotape, goober. We know you said it. Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> and I'm out of the pulpit, okay? God, she's ugly. And uh, <clears throat> got a face that only a mama could love, but me <laughs> turn the corner and meet her and <laughs> Oh, shut up. You've been thinking it. I'm just saying it. <clears throat> Says about Obamacare, you've got to pass it first to find out what's in it. And then someone a few months ago asked her, how do you feel about that statement? And she said, oh, you misunderstood what I said. Don't think about that too much. The brains come out your ears. Just don't think about it. I'm sitting in my chair last Thursday night watching television with, with, with the other twin, um, Kayla Strukaila, and I just, I, I'm just watching TV, and I just paused it, and I said, I grabbed my head, and I said, what planet are we living on? of what is going, I, I, I'm just, and it seems like nobody cares. It does. And, it, and if you look at it from that point, it literally looks hopeless. And what we Pentecostals, breathe in, because I'm about to slap you upside the head. What we've tried to do with our singing and shouting is we've tried to shout out what you gotta cast out. and take authority over. And the way you take authority over that is you go to God in prayer. You may not hear the wind blow. The earth may not shake. You may not hear thunder. But you have to understand that when you pray, God smells your prayer. Your praise has got a smell to it. Because the Bible says that the prayers and the praise <clears throat> was offered up to God out of the angel's hand on the altar before the throne of God. See, in the presence of God, there's a tabernacle. There's a church building. Now, you think and when the end time gets here, you're not going to have to go to church anymore. We're going to stand around, hold hands, sing kumbaya, float on clouds, play harps, and dip my feet in the crystal river. No, no. Some of us are going to be drinking out of that. You keep your nasty feet out of it. <laughs> Just making sure you're with us, amen. <clears throat> Eternity has become so real to me here lately because I'm beginning to see that what we have been taught or what we have thought most of our life that eternity will be like the thousand year millennial reign. Honey, it will be nothing. 
Now, one of the statements I've been making for the last couple of years is I truly believe that eternity, the millennial reign, and eternity will be so different than what we learned in the Bible Belt. It would be so different than what we thought it was going to be if it were possible, most Pentecostals would be disappointed with it. Because you have this, like you read people in the word of God, <clears throat> mighty man of God, David took a stone and brought down a giant, played the harp and, and, and demon spirits of God for King David. Yeah, took off his jacket, and danced for the Lord. Went and got the Ark of the Covenant and whoa, if he'd have had the Holy Ghost, he'd have shunned out every evening. But instead of shunned dying in some evenings, he turned on the internet, went up to the rooftop looking at the naked women. Oh, you remember David, don't you? Remember David, don't you? Dancing, shouting, rock throwing, heart playing, peeking David. You remember David, don't you? David had an issue with women. He liked good looking women. Now I don't fault him. You know, but David would <laughs> move on, Randy. Just move on, son. It's easy. Just just don't say what you're thinking. Just move on. But I can't do that. Had a lady come to me years ago smiling. Said, you know, my husband don't treat me like he used to. And I looked at her and I thought, remember I held my mouth. And I thought, well, if you would stop meeting him at the door, looking like a Bella Hay shot out of a cannon, things might pick up around your place. Come on, guys, stay with me. On your wedding day, you remember how beautiful she was and you were so moved. Whether you had a wedding in the church or the courthouse, you were so moved. She don't quite look the same as she used to. <laughs> she's not dressed in that beautiful dress every morning. She's wearing that nightgown that the hems tore out. It just hangs down. <laughs> Got that rip right here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Got them house shoes that she didn't bother to put on, just walk the backs of them down. <laughs> Come on, guys. Stay with me. Come on, ladies. Amen me. You know I'm helping you right now. <laughs> On guys, don't laugh too hard because you're not quite the same guy she married either. You got your jeans and your cowboy boots and that big belt buckle that never gets dull. It always is shiny because your big belly buff it all day. <laughs> Come on, ladies, y'all with me right now. See, that's why we've got, look here. That's why we got such a high rate of divorce in this nation is because you raised on soap operas. When the husband comes home and, and the music plays and, and the door shuts and she lolls and fuzz and, <laughs> and they embrace one another and the music gets louder and that's what you're looking for. No, no. When you wake up in the morning, they're going to have stinky breath. You young people, let me help you right now, all right? <laughs> Amen. Look here. Things change. You do get older. I mean, I was looking at some pictures the other day. I can't believe me and my wife in October have been married 30 years. 30 years. 30. Three decades. I feel like we've been married five years. She feels like 62. I, I feel like we've been married five. She's going to have a huge crown in heaven. Had a pastor, matter of fact, Pastor Hagee told my wife, if you get to heaven, they tell you your name's not in the book. Don't you worry about it. You tell them you just married that rascal right there and they'll let you in. <laughs> things change. And things have changed so much that we have moved so far from where we used to be, not just in marriage, but our lives that we've moved away in church from prayer. You have a prophecy teaching on Friday and Saturday night and you get a good crowd. You have a singing Dinner on the ground, you pack the building. You call a prayer meeting, you might have eight. Why? Because the devil knows if he can distract you from prayer, nothing changes. Because when you pray, God is listening. 
Now, God doesn't always answer in the way you think he should answer. But you have to be careful who you partner with and who you pray with because not everybody has good intentions at heart. February the 4th of this year, myself, Jesse Duplantis, Pastor Hagee, preachers just can't meet him with us and, and I was the Wednesday night speaker. My daughter Kyla was with me. <clears throat> After service, we went over to the pastor's house, large home. Um, they have different camp, four, four different campuses. Four different campuses, we went over to the pastor's house, probably 65 to 70 people there. It's about 11, 15, 11, 30 at night and I'm sitting at the head of the table. <clears throat> and the pastor came and said, our prayer team has been wanting to pray for you. Do you mind? I was tired. I, that's fine. I started to get up and they just gathered around me. So I sat back down. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't in the mood for prayer. I just preached. I was tired. It's 1130. I've got an hour's drive to get back to my, I'm going to drive all night or, or an hour that night rather to get back to the house. Didn't want to spend all night up there and I'm ready to go. So they get around and they start praying and me and my big mouth just begin to say, yes, Lord. Because you know, it's what the preachers do. Yes, Lord. You, know, when we, you can know when the preachers really don't want to mess with you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> okay. And that's what I was doing. And I said, Mark, yes, Lord, I receive it. I receive it. Because I heard some things. Yes, Lord, I receive it. We get in the car, and my daughter Kyla looks at me and says, Daddy, why did you let those people lay hands on you like that? I didn't like that. I said, baby, I was tired, and I just ready to go. And she said, I didn't like it, Dad. And I felt bad, and I started to stop them. And I said, baby, you feel that. You get up and stop them. So we drive home. My wife goes to bed early. <laughs> earlier than I do. We walk in at 12.30 and she's still awake. And I said, what you doing up? And I no more than said, what you doing up? And Kyla walks in and says, tell mama what happened. <laughs> so I started telling her, I'm not 30 seconds in the story. She raised up and she said, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I said, oh, give me on whatever. The next day, February the 5th, we're at the house. I said, I'm going to run to Staples and pick some stuff up. I go to Staples. I had on a winter jacket, you know, because you know, a light jacket don't get too cold in Houston. And uh, <clears throat> we actually have four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and monsoon. But, <laughs> and I was in Staples, and I thought, got a little warm. So I took my jacket off and laid it down. And when I turned, I hit the floor. I grabbed myself on one knee, and the manager said, sir, are you okay? And I got up, and I said, let me give myself. I said, Let me check out uh, here at the counter. And <clears throat> I said I'll be fine. When I, time I checked out and got to the car, I knew something was wrong. I called Renee and I said, "Listen, if I don't call you in ten minutes, you call me. I'm not feeling very well and I don't want to drive right now. You call me." And you know, Daddy can be and Randy can be a little dramatic at times, and so not a lot of people. You know, and it sounded, okay, whatever, you're fine, whatever. In three minutes, I laid back in the car that we'd rented to drive. That we, I laid back and I knew I was dying. And I didn't know why. And so I grabbed the phone and I called the house and I answered Renee. And I called Evan. I said, y'all need to get here. In just a few minutes, they came from the house. And when they opened the door of that car, I was laying back. And my wife's words later was this. And my youngest son talked to me Thursday. She said, you were ashen gray and I knew you were dying. My youngest son Thursday in the kitchen, I talked to him and I said, boy, I sure am glad I didn't die February the 5th. And uh, <laughs> I can't tell you what he said. He might, might be offended. <laughs> yeah, he said, yeah, dad, that would have sucked. And uh, that's kind of how our family is, man. <laughs> He said, but dad, he said, when I got there and I saw you, I knew something was wrong. All balance was gone. I couldn't stand up. They picked me up. They dragged me over and they said, you're going to the emergency room. When I got to the emergency room, I, I don't throw up. If I throw up, I'm sick. 
And I said, I'm going to be sick. And they got me sitting in a chair to brace me in, in a wheelchair. And I said, I'm going to be sick. It had been raining. My sons grabbed an umbrella bag that you put your umbrella in. And not to be gross, but I filled it. Stuff came out of my intestines. Stuff came out of me. And I'm in the, I'm in the emergency room. They're running tests. They don't know why the organs are not responding like they're supposed to be. They don't know. They can't find anything. But they know something is shutting down. We begin to pray. Didn't alert a lot of people, but we begin to pray. Okay? I begin to stabilize because of prayer. Because I was leaving this planet February the 5th. And because of prayer, I begin to stabilize. And just as healthy as a horse. Okay? Just strong and healthy. Couldn't forget. Six hours of testing. The doctor walks in and says, Mr. Caldwell, we can't find anything. But we want to keep you overnight. Well, by this point, I know what's going on. I said, well, doctor, if you didn't find anything, I'm going to go ahead and go to the house. If I'm going to be sick, I can be sick at the house. He said, well, Mr. Caldwell, it's a little too late to dismiss you. And I just reared up and I said, well, doc, I appreciate it, but you need to put on your little clipboard. Mr. Caldwell said he's going to the house. Give me my pants. I'm going to the house. And I went home and I recognized what was going on. Now, let me tell you. Unbeknownst to me, we found out the following week that in that prayer group, a lady had walked in the room that nobody knew and laid her hand in the middle of my back. And me and my big mouth, whatever she was praying, I said, I receive it. You better hear me, guys. The next day, Pastor Hagee calls. I know what's going on. I had you on my mind. I didn't even get started. And he said, son, that's demonic. And he started praying. The next week, John Olstein, the guy who passed away, his best friend, Gerald Hilly, called me. Preacher, what's going on? You've been on my mind. I hadn't told anybody. And I said, well, I just, and just had, he said, that's demonic. That's witchcraft. And he began to research because it's his son's church. And they got to looking and found out this lady had been and one of the associates saw her come in and didn't know who she was. Now what had happened, the next week, we're gonna go be with Sam and Tina. I'm laying in bed, can't stand up, can't walk, can't sit up. Balance is gone. Stagger everywhere. Try to help me with my walking. Now listen to me. If you are not careful, you can get so used to being sick that that becomes your identification. You better hear what I'm telling you. You can stay sick for so long and not get the healing that you won't heal that it becomes familiar to you and that sickness begins to identify who you are. If I die tomorrow, you put on my tombstone, he died trusting God because I ain't going that direction. <laughs> Amen? Brother Hilly calls. Now I was in bed till Saturday morning. I'm supposed to preach on Sunday night. I've been in bed three days. Sunday morning, I wake up and I look at Kayla and my wife and I said, load the car. I can't sit up, make me a bed. We drove seven and a half hours for me to preach on Sunday night. And I did. Staggering all over, holding in the front seat. My wife is sitting there praying in the Holy Ghost. Woman of faith. And I turned and I said, pastor sitting there and I said, good Lord, I'm dizzy. My wife said, don't say that, don't say that. And I said, when I pass out on this floor, you tell her I said I was dizzy. <laughs> Come on, guys. People begin to call. Rabbi Kurt Landry called. What's going on? What happened to you, Brother Caldwell, February the 5th? Do what? He said, there was a spirit of witchcraft and death structure that was released against you. I fly one month later to Anchorage, Alaska. A rabbi friend of mine in the pastor's office I walk in, the liaison for the rabbi, she's sitting there, good friend of mine. She, I walk in and say, hey, how you doing? She said, hey, Brother Kawa, gotta go. I look at the pastor, I said, what's wrong with her? He said, never seen her act like that. So the next day, we said, okay, need to talk to you. So me and my wife and my oldest son, Devin, go to the pastor's house. Him and his wife and his son and this woman and her husband walk in, we sit down at the dinner table. Soon as we sit down, she says, well, I guess you wonder why I was acting so strange yesterday. I said, yeah, and she said, when you walked in, Dr. Caldwell, something was following you. And it had death in its hands. And she said, I wanted to pray about it before I told you. And I saw you a while ago. She said, it's gone now. And she said, what happened February the 5th? And I said, I don't know, you tell me. 
She said, I saw you laying back, her exact words. I saw you laying back and you were ashen gray. My wife just puts her fork down and starts crying. And she said, Dr. Caldwell, you were supposed to die February the 5th. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I don't know, and this is a Jewish woman, I don't know what you're preaching to the Christian church. This is what I've been preaching right here. The time clock. And she said, I don't know what you've been preaching, but you have upset the Nephilim, the demonic realm so bad that there's seven levels and the highest level is called the Raphaelim. And February the 5th, they released a demon spirit on you to kill you to stop the message you're preaching. And she said, because of the revelatory anointing and because of prayers, they were unable to do what they wanted to do. Now listen. And I looked at her and said, well, they should have killed me because now they've ticked me off. (laughs) Now listen to me. I have learned now that spiritual attacks can cause physical problems. And I'll be honest with you, and it's leaving in Jesus' name. If I turn too fast, or if I get overly tired, I still stagger. Okay, I'll just like like a drunk, and it makes me fight mad. But I have determined I will not carry this any longer than I have to carry it. And I'm not returning back physically 100%. I have made the statement, I'm gonna go to 120% of what I was and gonna give the devil more trouble than he ever thought I was giving him before. Look, look, say preacher, you're just bragging. I'm not bragging. I'm telling you, there is an attack upon leadership. There's an attack upon ministries, upon their bodies, because you cannot stand up and teach and preach the truth to people if you are physically ill. I'm here to tell you that you need to pray more than you have ever prayed before. That strength come to your body. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command strength to come to Winston McClure's body. I command complete healing to come to Carl. I command that what the devil had planned has to be canceled and by the laying on of hands we rebuke sickness somebody agree together in the name of Jesus now be gone now watch now Carl can I really brother Winston y'all receive that because we agree together. We agree together. Why? Because prayer still changes things. And if God can make an eyeball out of a mud ball, I've got good sales going on. Now look, I need to do better. I'm a little, I've put on a little weight. And I was really worried about coming here because I know y'all are like me. You speak what you see. And I know I've put on a little weight since I've been here last. But by Friday night, my fears was eased when I got to looking at some of (laughs) y'all. Apparently it's a great blessing going around. More head is doing well. Look here. If you have sugar diabetes, First of all, you can't be eating pie and cake all day long and pray. Well, I'm sowing, I'm sowing bad seed, but I'm praying for crop, crop failure. That ain't how it works. Okay? If you have type two, it will. If you have type two diabetes, you need to clean your diet up. If you have juvenile sugar diabetes, you need a divine miracle and healing because that's in the bloodline. But type two diabetes comes from diet. Oh my God, let's see. We're here, we're supposed to be talking about prayer and we're off on food. Well, Brother Cowell, I've got a right to do what I want. You do. See, that's the thing here in America. I've got a right, I've got a right. Let me explain something to you. Just because you have a right, don't make it right. They're hollering about their rights. Got a right, got a right. Isn't it crazy that America, 
was founded. Now listen. America was founded, first of all, as a tax revolt. Go figure. That's why they're upset. The colonies founded it. Christopher Columbus discovered it and will stumble over top of it. Okay? Freedom in America is not founded for freedom to. It was freedom from. Freedom is not to do what you want to do. Freedom from tyranny. Freedom from leadership oppressing. Wow, we've come a mighty long way, had not we? But this all can change if my people. But call, I'm praying, I don't see any, I don't see results. Don't worry about it. God is bottling them up. Every prayer you pray is being bottled up in heaven. <clears throat> your prayer and your praise, wasn't quite done. Your prayer and your praise, and it don't just take one. We've all got to work together. I said we've got to work together. See, I need Brother Sam, Brother Joe, would y'all, uh, well, we don't get chairs, just come and help me. All right? <clears throat> y'all sit on either side of me, if you don't mind. Okay? Now, you've seen this, so let me explain, Joe. What we're going to do is we're going to do this. Okay? And then we're going to do this here. Rub fast. Okay, like that. And then we're going to do like this. And while we're patting our legs, we're going to do this. And then we're going to stop stomping and keep patting. And then we're going to do this. And we're going to do this. You ready? All right, let's go. It's official. Caldwell has finally snapped. <laughs> He's lost his mind. Let me show you something. <clears throat> Y'all gonna help us. Okay? We gonna make it rain. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't throw dollar bills, I throw nickels to make it hail. <clears throat> I'm a baller on the budget. All right, look here. Now watch, watch. We're gonna do this. And I'm going to start here, and then you're going to join, and then you're going to join. And y'all keep doing it. Don't do it until I say stop. And then I'm going to come back over here, and while you're snapping, we're going to do this. And then we'll go across the room, and then we're going to pat. And then while we're patting, I'll come back, and you'll do your feet. And we'll go across the room. And then when I come back, you'll stop stomping, but keep patting. And we'll go back, and then we'll go here, and then we'll do that. Ready? Now, I'm going to show you something. Now, I want you to be real quiet and listen to it rain. You Ready? I know y'all help them. Y'all help them. You do that side. I'll do the middle and you just over here. I'm going to snap first. Ready? Go. Everybody. Come on. Everybody. Do it. No, no. Stop. No. Everybody has to play or this doesn't work. All right? So everybody here, let's go. Snap. Keep it going. Well, how stupid did it look when we was doing it? <laughs> but when everybody worked together, yes. something fascinating yes. happened. Then it sounded just, and y'all went, I heard about, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, wow. Because it's a cool demonstration. Thank you, gentlemen. It's the same way, guys, with prayer. It was just me and my four and no more. God answers prayer. But something about a group of people, a nation, a county, a church, a family, 
that will join together and say, no matter what, we are going to pray. Back in 80 and 81, we had a drought in Arkansas. We had a governor in Arkansas who loved Pentecost. Been in service with him several times. Called me by first name. He was a governor. And you know, he's, he's, he's an incredible memory. His name is Bill Clinton. And we had a horrible, horrible drought going on in Arkansas. And he made a proclamation on Sunday morning, on, on, on Friday and Saturday, that this coming Sunday, he wanted every church in Arkansas to pray for rain. By 2.30 Sunday afternoon, Rain hit the state of Arkansas. Just out of nowhere. I remember that 35 years ago. What would happen if we would understand, although you may not get immediate results, the rain is coming. My mama, Lois Caldwell, was a prayer warrior, a teacher of the word of God. Man, she could pray. Man, she could pray. And my mama uh, got dementia and signs of Alzheimer's and she went very quick after dad passed away. And, and you know, you be around her. You, you had to laugh or cry. Just, it was just, it was just funny. And, and when mom got so bad, nobody could keep her at the house anymore had to put her in a nursing home. Well, they put her in a room with a woman named Virgie who had the same thing my mother had. And Virgie was the name of my grandmother, my mom's mom. So every day, these two women, my mother and this lady, would have the same conversation. How are you doing this morning? Good. What's your name? My name is Virgie. Oh, that was my mother's name. Are you my mother? I don't know. Same conversation two or three times a day. Oh, that's sad. That was kind of funny. But mom's doing good. Don't worry about it. She's a lot better now. Okay? And, and mom thought all of us boys was her brothers. And the oldest brother, Dean, she thought was dad, who had passed away in February of 10. She thought it was dad. So the last Christmas, Christmas of 11, we were all together. And mom was pretty much, you know, pretty much gone. She'd have flashes at times, but couldn't remember anybody. I was telling Sam a while ago that um, Sister Jerry got up here and then, <laughs> that was my mom. That's, that's what she'd do. She'd do this right here. That's what she'd do, like that right there. <clears throat> Dean told me, he said, well, mom, mom's name is Lois, and Dean took her out to eat at McDonald's. And he said, Randy, I told him, now, Mom, you sit right here. I'm going to go order, and I'll be right back. And he said, Randy, I got to the counter, and I turned and looked, and she's gone. I said, dear Lord, I've lost Lois. I've lost Lois. She sure is the world. And he said, I went around the corner to see where she went, and she was going from table to table, saying, hey, we sure appreciate y'all coming out today. to be." She was still in church. I got, yeah, I'm just cute, whatever. It's funny. It was hilarious. It was hilarious. What do you want? We just want to take him an offering. Great. All right, gotcha. <clears throat> the last Christmas we were together, and you would have to see my other brothers. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I had to be adopted. There is, there is no way I'm from that gene pool. There, there's no way. And I've said that for years. If it wasn't for this nose... With the big nostrils up on the side, you can see the back of my head. I would deny being one of them. <laughs> but right here, it's a dead giveaway, right here. All right, now watch. The last Christmas we were together, mom hadn't recognized anybody. Now she's sitting over there with the daughter-in-laws and we're sitting on the other side of the fellowship hall. And my mother looks at the daughter-in-law and said, hey, do y'all see my little Randy sitting over there? And they said, yes, grandma. She said, my mama had him and brought him to me to raise. I said, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. 
the Tuesday before Thanksgiving of 2011, she was staying with my brother Bob. And she had started doing some crazy stuff that you just really had to be careful with her. So she's sitting down, and Bob walked in the room. She said, Bob, will you come and sit with me? He said, Mom, I'm okay sitting right here. What do you want? She said, can I come over there? And he said, yeah. And she walked over, and she sat down. She said, now, Bob, I want you to look at me, and I want you to listen to me. Her mind's been gone for a long time, several months. She said, don't you listen to me. After today, I'm not going to know you anymore. So you listen to me. The Holy Ghost has touched me today. And she said, I want you to promise me that you're going to tell Randy how much I appreciate what he's done for me and your daddy. She goes down the list. She says, tell Bill, tell Terry and Dean, tell what time. She named all the kids. She said, I got to promise you're going to tell him. He's crying. She's crying. She said, because now after today, I won't remember you all no more. She got to promise me you're going to do that. He said, Mom, I will. And that was it. She never remembers anymore. Okay? But the Christmas before we left, just a month later, we got ready to go. And somebody said, Mom, would you like to pray before we all leave? She said, I would. Mine gone. Preach under the anointing. We reached over and we grabbed hands. Remember, we all grabbed hands like this. And that little gal, mine gone for months, bowed her head and said, Father, we come to you today. And son, the hair come up on the back of my neck. The anointing of God was so strong. Now, the time she got done, okay, granted, she was praying for the cats and the trees and all, that's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the anointing that was there. That Lois Caldwell's prayers for 56 years of ministry is bottled up in heaven. And she prayed, God, protect my kids. February the 5th, God went and got Lois's prayer bottle said, dump that thing out and let me smell that. I told her I'd take care of them five boys and that girl. <laughs> and he was, because see, smells trigger memories. You smell something that may remind you of grandma's biscuits? You have to understand, people say, well, Bill Cole, I'm afraid I'm gonna die and never see my kids saved. Who ever told you you had to be alive to see your kids saved? Where'd you get that scripture? See, when you pray, God bottles your prayers up in heaven. And you could be dead for 40 years in the graveyard. And that lost son is now 65 years old. Hadn't been in church in 50 years. And he blunders in on the service at House of Prayer on a Sunday morning. She blunders in because somebody invited them to come and hear the little Texas tornado preacher. And you think you just came as a favor. God has set you up. Because what God does is when that old boy who hadn't been in church 50 years walks in that church on a Sunday morning, an Easter Sunday or a special weekend, go get me mama's prayer bottle and begins to pour that prayer out again on the altar and smells that old saint of God's prayer 50 years earlier. God, whatever you do, don't let my kids be lost. And God says, look, who's in church this morning? Holy Ghost. Go send conviction. Conviction comes and that person because of prayers that was prayed 50 years earlier from a grandmother that prayed for grandchildren that you never even met Amen. is poured out on the altar of God. Amen. And God begins to smell those prayers again and it reminds him of the promise and God is not slack concerning his promises. No matter what you believe, no matter where you are in this juncture in life, no matter what you are facing, you have to understand that somebody has been praying for you. Amen. And a seed was sown. Now watch. It doesn't matter what situation you're in right now. That seed can grow even in captivity. And I'm gonna close with this. When I was just a kid, we lived at Rock Creek. Something really neat, I remember, George and Carrie LaFoon, they, they were old my whole life. He died at 93 and 94. They were old my whole life. He died when I was like 27. So, I mean, he was old my whole life. And I used to go to their house, and they'd say, Randy, come here. They'd call me Seed Dick. I said, Seed Dick, come here. And I would go in the kitchen 
And I would, they would have these, not just, I don't think done every year, but I'd seen it, and they had these little bottles. And inside this glass bottle was a green apple, a whole green apple inside the bottle. Bottleneck that big around, that apple, that big around. It was in that bottle. And that was the neatest thing. How in the world did they get that apple in that bottle? There's no cut marks, no slicing. And that was just that was just astounding to me. One spring, I was out playing in the woods and I come up behind their house where they had an apple tree. I thought, what in the world's in that tree? And I look, and they had bottles taped on the limb that they had stuck that limb. Oh, you better stay with me right now. They'd put that bottle on that limb where that apple bud was and let that thing grow. And when they, oh, Lord, that was the, and I went and said, well, them sneaky old people <laughs> trying to trick me. And that was a life lesson to me when I was five and six years old. What's this? Seed just grows, although it may be captivity. Now watch. It still grows. Brother Cole, that apple was in captivity even when it was fully mature. Yeah, but all you got to do to get the fruit of it is just break the bottle. That's it, amen. Oh, you hear what I'm telling you? And what I'm saying to you is, guys, y'all have not seen yet what God has promised for Rowan County. Is that how you pronounce it, Rowan? Rowan. Rowan. They call it Rowan in Texas. <laughs> Rowan County, Rowan County. This part of Kentucky God has heard the prayers of saints for years. My house shall be called a house of prayer. 43 years ago, a man heard from God. Some of y'all ain't even 43. Some of y'all when this church was started was just a baby. Some of you just a teenager and you remember God's plan when he started this church body of believers to assemble together in a lumber shed has not forgotten nor has he canceled the original plan. And if you think that you're just here to have this building is here just to have somewhere to go on a weekend because your social life stinks and you ain't got nowhere else to go. You are, you are wrong, son. Uh, I don't want to say that. You, you have misunderstood. Okay? And I'm here to tell you and to challenge you this morning that God bottles those prayers up and God is still listening. God is still watching and he has not forgotten. It was my goal this morning when I left the hotel room. I said, Lord, I don't just want to make them stand up and clap and shout. Help me to say something that they won't forget. To cause you to pray. I have started since February the 5th every day from that day to this. When I open my eyes, the first words out of my mouth is God, thank you for my health. When you thank God for your blessing, it extends them. When you don't thank him for your blessing, it ends them. Because harvest is not a one-time thing. If you want a harvest, you actually have to plant earlier. And once you reap a harvest, if you eat all the seed, you got nothing left. To have another harvest, you got to plant again. Robert Schuler, I'm done. Robert Schuler, I don't, I don't know how you feel about him. I met his grandson, Bobby Shooter, TBN a few months ago. Great kid. He's not a kid. He's 31 years old. But his grandfather, I was listening to him one time, and he was talking about soybeans. He's talking about sowing and reaping. And he told a story about a farmer that had listened to him teach about sowing and reaping. The farmer had had a failure crop of soybeans. He literally was walking through the field to try to pick out and gather what they could gather. 
And he said, in the middle of all this drought, there was this one plant. And he said, it was just loaded with soybeans. So he took every soybean off that plant, dried them out, and next spring planted them on one acre of ground. I remember the number of what he got. In three years' time, he was planting 120 acres. One plant. And so when Dr. Shooter opened up the letter and read it, there was a package in there that said, it worked for me, it worked for you, here's your bean. Now whether he meant it critical, however he meant, I'm just telling you that there's good soil in Kentucky. All it needs is some seed. All it needs is some water. I'm not just talking about finances, I'm talking about prayer. It needs watering, it needs tending to. And I'm telling you, even though things are about to get rough in the next 60 days, and you, you mark this preacher down, this nation is about to see some of the greatest natural disasters we have ever seen because God judges a nation through his leadership. And this decision of homosexual marriage same-sex marriage is going to cost this nation dearly. I don't care whether the politicians like it. They can do it. Look here. They have took shots at me several times already. You keep me covered by prayer. But I'm just telling you guys, this nation is in for some natural disasters before the end of this year. You mark it down. Things are about to get rough. But if you pray, he will heal your land. And the plagues of Egypt will not have to come nigh unto your dwelling because of prayer. Prayer still changes things. I'm done. Give God a hand clap of praise.